Today's course description is, <clears throat> this course provides an overview focusing on the components of hollow metal, doors, frames, doors and frames, the hows and whys they provide um, for the pr uh, preservation and reuse of existing facilities, uh, providing life cycle costs with maintaining building code, compliance and building form. So <clears throat> there's a lot of frames out there. You can use wood frames, hollow metal frames and aluminum frames. Um, in this presentation, we're going to discuss hollow metal frames and what the benefits are of using a hollow metal frame as opposed to um, an aluminum frame and even a wood frame. Today's learning objectives are going to be um, identifying the basic components of hollow metal doors and frames. You know, what do they look like? How do we identify them in the field? Um, how can we tell the differences between single rabbit, double rabbit, um, equal rabbit, unequal rabbit? What do all those terms mean? Uh, we'll go through them as we um, as we go through the presentation and if you have any questions let me know because you know frames and doors they can be a little bit difficult sometimes in our industry um, as everyone knows our industry is a little bit unique uh, there's a lot of um, industry standards and questions and, and things like that that if you do not know if you haven't grown up in the industry you just will not know so uh, make sure to ask we'll be able to recognize standard in industry terminology some of the things that i just said you know, single rabbit, double rabbit, seamless, um, inseam, um, pan and lid, or <laughs> and things like that. The term, the terminology and and as it relates to hollow doors and frames, we'll be able to specify the appropriate components required to achieve uh, the desired results. And then at the end, we'll be able to understand the content of Division Eight's openings, which is hollow metal doors and frames, and the ANSI standards. Why use steel? One of the most important uh, reasons is fire resistance. Um, aluminum frames and wood frames, you can go up to um, 90 minute, 45 minute, and things like that. But with fire, with a fire rated hollow metal frame, you can go up to three, three hours. Um, and at the end of the day, we wanna be able to preserve our building, uh, extend the building life. And in the event that we do have smire, uh, fire or smoke damage, uh, we wanna be able to limit that to um, the room that it starts in. Um, <clears throat> steel is impervious to bad weather. Now, it depends on what type of steel that you're using, whether it be uh, cold rolled steel or galvanized steel, um, whether it be A60, A90, and things like that, but um, it's impervious to bad weather. It's long lasting, it's durable. So unlike aluminum jams and wood jams that can be damaged in the field very easily, you know, by hitting it with a cart or just scratching it or things like that, Hollow metal is very uh, long lasting and durable. It's earth friendly. And then lastly, um, can be designed to fit nearly every application, whether it be a borrowed light, a side light, a three sided hollow metal frame, um, or a four sided hollow metal frame. Any application that's out there, exteriors, interiors, um, we can pretty much always specify a hollow metal frame. So the four basic categories that we're going to be looking at when looking at hollow metal frames are going to be frames themselves in general, transom frames, side light frames, and then borrowed lights. Now, I want you guys to take a look at the last three, transom frames, side lights, and borrowed lights. They all kind of seem very similar, um, but these three applications um, are very different in their own right. Um, with a borrowed light frame, you can tell that at the bottom there, you have two windows. Excuse me, let's go back. You have two windows that are looking through here, but what you don't have is a door in the, in the center or on the side. And with a side light frame, you have a door in the center in this description, and then you have windows on the side, but you also have one at the top, similar to what the transom frame looks like. Now, how does this make them different? Well, we'll go through that. When looking at frames, frames are units that contain single or multiple door openings with horizontal transom members. They can be three sided or four sided. They can have flush or rabbited panels immediately above the doors. They can be set up as welded, knocked down, or knocked down drywall. Now, there's big differences between the three, um, whether it be welded, knocked down, or knocked down drywall. And we'll go through those in a second. But as you can see, and all these frame applications we have a standard three-sided frame we have a four-sided frame with a door inside of it we have right here a three-sided frame that's dutch door application 
And then here we have a pair of doors. This one right here is going to be, and you can't really tell what it's looking looking at or looking like, but this is going to be a double egress opening where you have one door that goes one way and one that goes the opposite. This one right here, you have uh, a bank of doors where you have a pair and then you have a single door. Then this is the transom frame. And then lastly, we have a transom pair. A transom is this little unit at the top, allowing light at the top of the door to go through. And we'll see that in this next description. Transom frames contain single or multiple door openings with single or multiple openings above that are separated um, with a horizontal mullion. The openings above the doors are called transoms. The transom can be filled with glazing material, panels, or louvers. Transom frames are generally available only in setup um, and welded construction. Why are they only available in welded construction? Well, on the previous slide, we saw that uh, we had knockdown and knockdown drywall construction. And what those terminologies are, a knockdown frame is a frame that is unassembled and not welded, where you have the head of the frame and then the, the two frame legs, um, which that, those two terminologies will also be discussed here in a little while, where they're set up um, in the field, usually in a retrofit application or even in new construction, but it's they're usually set up whenever the walls are already built. Welded frames are set up prior to the walls being um, finished or the sheetrock being finished. So that's what that terminology means. How does that relate to the transom? Well, because there's a horizontal mullion in the center and because of the way that it's set up with the louver or light um, be, having to be applied at the top, if you put that into a knockdown application, it'd be too hard uh, most of the time to set that mullion inside and secure it in a way to where it, it will not rattle, shake, or even come loose. So you usually want to you usually want to set that up to where it's already welded prior to um, being sent out to the job site. <clears throat> Here are some photos of some side light frames. Side light frames, single or multiple door openings with adjacent openings for glazing materials, panels, or louvers. Um, separated with a vertical mullion. Instead of a horizontal mullion that goes across, like you see with, right here, these are separated with a vertical mullion that goes in the center, or that goes in the middle, excuse me. The open adjacent to the doors are called side lights. Side light frames make it, may also incorporate transom openings. Side light frames are normally available only in setup and welded construction. So just like a transom frame, Side light frames are usually sent out already welded. Now, <clears throat> earlier we saw in the transom slide that they had panels or glazing materials or even louvers. I didn't hit on that, but really quickly, what that means is at the very top of the frame, um, if you have glazing material, that's going to be glass, so that way you can see through it. <clears throat> or you could have a panel that's at the very top. That panel um, is going to, you know, either look exactly like the door material that it's going in with, or it could be a, you know, a painted finish um, to where it just blocks out the view, but it can be accessible at a later time. And then you could have a louver. Now, what the louver would do is allow airflow um, between the two spaces. With a side light jam, you could have the exact same setup as the transom jam, uh, where you have panels or louvers. But most of the time, you'll see that there, these areas here are glazed. Windows and barred lights. Windows are frame products that contain single or multiple openings for glazing material only. A window that contains only one opening is also called a barred light or a view window. Bald lights are available in setup and welded knockdown or knockdown drywall construction. Normally, all other configurations are set up and welded. So with a bald light frame, why do they call this a bald light? <clears throat> well, a quick and easy definition of this is a bald light frame is used to separate two um, spaces, but one space borrows the light from another. So if you have 
uh, two spaces, let's say, let's say you're in an interrogation room and you have a window that looks just like this, even though um, the two spaces aren't borrowing, borrowing each other's light because of the way that the rooms are set up. Whenever the lights come on in that interrogation space, light filters from one side through to the other side, um, which goes with the definition of a being a borrowed light. Now, borrowed light doesn't have to only be single glazed. As you can see in these, these other photos here, this one is double glazed, and then this one has four lights in it. But all of these are borrowed lights. All of these are going to be set up in a four-sided four construction. And you're going to have glazing material and glazing bead on one side to secure them with. These are usually only set up as a welded frame, uh, but they can be provided um, loose. It's not really recommended, however. Uh, what you want to do, set these up at, at, as a welded construction, put these in prior to your sheetrock or your finishing uh, of your wall material. Now, after seeing that, <clears throat> Let's look at some frame components. And before I get into that, I'm going to go ahead and ask if anyone has a question. Um, so that way we can get that out of the way there. Sorry, guys. OK. Maybe that's why I was having so much trouble earlier. So let's take a look at this again. It's my first day on the job, so I apologize, guys. But let's take a look at the components. There are some major components to a uh, frame that differentiate itself from, um, from a four-sided frame. So a three-sided frame being different than a four-sided frame is going to be separated by this right here. But let's look at what components make up a frame itself. The first one being the hinge jam. This is the side of the frame where the door is going to be located. But, and you could have either have one or two hinges. You could have four hinges. And depending on the door size, you could have even more hinges than that. But this is going to be called the hinge jam at all times. On the opposite side of that, where the door closes into, is going to be called the strike jam. At the top of the frame, where the door connects, but it's at the very top, it's called the head jam. And at the bottom, if you have a four-sided frame that with a swinging door in it, it'll be called the sill, as you can see right here. Now, with a borrowed light, it'll be a four-sided jam and no door swinging in it. But at the bottom, it'll still be called the seal. So at the bottom of the jam, it's called the seal. At the top, it's called the head. And on the hinge side, hinge jam. On the strike side, the strike jam. On a pair of doors, where you will not have a bottom piece, you'll have a threshold, you have two hinge jams, but one of them being a right hinge jam and one of them being a left hinge jam. And then again, you'll have the head jam. Now, do you see right here where this says right hand hinge jam and left hand hinge jam. Keep those in mind when looking at door handings and things like that. Um, frames, just like doors, are going to be handed. And you have to know how to look at a door and a frame and um, I guess know how to um, how to hand those hand, how to hand those openings. The easiest way that I learned, which I'm not saying that this is the best way or the only way, there are many different ways, but the way that I learned and I learned the easiest was I take a look at the outside of the opening, which is going to be the side where your key is inserted into the opening or um, the outside of the room that you're entering into. And you look at the frame and you see which side um, you have hinges on, whether it be on the right side or the left side. Now, for this example, let's say the hinges are on the left-hand side. If my hinges are on the left-hand side and the door opens away from me, that is a left-hand frame. That's a left-hand door. If the hinges are on the left-hand side, 
same example, but the door opens to me. That's a left hand reverse. That's a left hand reverse door. It's a left hand reverse frame. Same way for the opposite side. Now, in today's class, we're not going to get into handings and things like that. We're not going to talk about barn door track and how pocket doors and, and those things are handed, but it, it all goes um, with that simple uh, with that simple method. If you know how to look at the outside of the opening and pick up your hand and say, okay, this is the side that the hinges are on. Does it open away from me? Does it open to me? It's a, if it opens away, it's a right hand or left hand. And if it opens to me, it's a reverse hand. That's always been um, a huge argument in our industry. So now let's look at some more in, in depth um, frame components. <clears throat> this is a side light and transom frame. Um, as you can see, they're constructed of both open and closed sections. At the very top here, just like on the other frame, this is our head. And if, if you take out all of these sections, this is our head. This is our hinge jam. This is our strike jam. But in this section and in this training, because we have side lights, this is going to be called a hinge mullion. And this is going to be called a strike mullion. The reason it's called that is because this is a mullion that makes up this four sided frame here. Um, and this mullion is closed on this side. Whenever you have a pair of doors or a single or a pair of frames or a single door uh, frame, the outside at the top and on the sides is going to be opened to receive the sheetrock. But on the inside where you have your head, your hinge, and your strike, whenever you have side lights or a transom, this is going to be closed to allow for you know, a seamless look uh, whenever you're putting that glazing material in there. This is also a vertical mullion, just like this. The difference between the two is this side right here is machined to receive the hinges. This is, this is machined to receive glazing bead only. As we discussed earlier, you see right here, this is a seal section. It's the bottom of the frame, bottom of the frame. And then right here, you have a blank jam, but it's open on the outside. Same with this side. This is a strike section, but it's open on this side. Um, so it's, this is going to be called a blank jam. This also is going to be called a blank jam because there's no machining um, on the opposite side of it. Here's what some of those profiles look like. This is a double rabbit jam. Now with this, you can have a double return or you can have a single return. A double return is going to be a drywall return is what it's called. And what it's used for is whenever you slide that rock in, you have a smooth surface for that for that rock to slide in. And then because it's open right here, it basically creates a cleat to where the drywall does not want to slip back. If you have an open return like this one right here, this is usually going to be um, considered a masonry return. Uh, a standard single return. Those are some of the terminologies that you'll use. And what this is used for is when you have a masonry jam and there's nothing that's going to be sliding into this, um, you don't need to have this double return here for anything to slide in because there's nothing that's going to slide in. Now, looking at this double rabbit open section, what's a rabbit? This right here is a rabbit. The spacing uh, where the door is going to be sliding into whenever it's closing is called the rabbit. This right here, this portion right here is called the stop. Why is it called the stop? Because the door when it closes hits on the stop. This right here is called the soffit. And again, on this side, you have the rabbit. Now, there's a, <clears throat> this one right here is called a double rabbit open section. Um, it's open section because right here is where it's open. As you can see, um, this is going to be some industry terminology. This is your throat of your jam. The throat is going to be your actual wall size. And then you're going to have jam depth. Um, and that's going to be the actual jam size. The out to out of your jam is your jam depth. And the out to out of your 
your uh, wall is your throat. Going down, and, and we have this also in our industry, this is called a single rabbit open section. It's called a single rabbit because we have our rabbit here, we have our stop, and then this is our soffit. There's no other um, stop or rabbit on the opposite side. So this is called a single rabbit opening. Coming down, this is called a double egress frame. Double egress frame is when you have a, um, a door in a hospital is where you're most commonly going to see this in the path of egress in a corridor where you have people going down the right hand side of the corridor on one side and the right hand side of the corridor on the opposite side to keep the flow of traffic you know because you have patient uh, beds going through um, you have a lot of um, ADA compliant um, persons or uh, people going through a handicapped persons going through um, you'll see that the flow of traffic is on the right side and on the right side. So what you have is a um, left-hand reverse on one side and a left-hand reverse on the opposite side to keep that flow of traffic. And so how do you do that whenever you have a three-sided jam and you have a stomp on the a stop that's supposed to be on one side of the jam, but the doors are opening in opposite directions? That's where you'll see something like this. A double egress frame. Um, always messes folks up because of the way that it looks. You see how it's it's shaped in a way like a, kind of like stairs and then on the opposite side on the head it's just one one little stop and then a, a small little soffit here and the reason it's done that way is so that way the doors can be hung on the opposite sides of each other and they can swing in that direction. The head itself is set up in two pieces to where the stop is on one side of a jam and then the, the opposite side of the other jam. So that way, whenever the doors open, they can freely open and allow for egress. And then whenever they close, they hit a stop on both the, the jam side and then the head side. Going up here, this is a double rabbit for a uh, double rabbit mullion. And as you can see, you have your um, opposite side of your rabbit. You have the stop, you have your soffit, you have your stop, and then you have your rabbit. But you can tell with this opening here, there's glazing that's going to be going on. And this is a top, this is called a top section view of these jams. So if this was standing vertically, you would see a side light frame um, here. Or if you're looking at a cross section, which you could also be looking at here, this would be a transom. And this would be the head of the frame going in. So this going down from double rabbit mullion to single rabbit mullion, you have the same thing, except you just don't have another return. You don't have another stop or another rabbit on the opposite side. Now, I guess a, a good question would be, why do people have um, a double rabbit on frames when it's not necessary? Well, if you have a um, a stocking distributor or a stocking warehouse, you could get blank jams with no hinges prepped in your jams, and you could use one skew to produce a frame that is either right hand or left hand without the need for of getting um, an unequal rabbit that's right hand, unequal rabbit that's left hand. You could use one skew to machine your hinges on this side or machine your hinges on this side to where it gives you flexibility in your facility to um, to provide that frame as either right hand or left hand. Now with this double rabbit frame right here, this is an equal rabbit frame. And as you can see, why do we call it an equal rabbit? This rabbit right here measures an inch and 15 sixteenths. This rabbit right here is also an inch and 15 sixteenths. This will accommodate a one and three quarter inch door on either side without a problem. Now, I just said a, a one and three quarter inch door going into an inch and fifteenths, um, you know, rabbit. Why isn't it one and three quarters of an inch? Well, you have to have a sixteenth of an inch space um, to allow that that opening to close into it. So, let's look at this jam profile. This right here is showing a typical three and five eighths inch wall 
plus two five eighths inch drywall, which will give you a four and seven eighths inch throat. That four and seven eighths inch throat will be considered a five and three quarter inch um, jam depth because the typical return on a hollow metal frame is one half of an inch. It's not five eighths of an inch. So we'll have a five and three quarter inch return or yeah, five and three quarter inch jam depth on a four and seven eighths inch throat. And it'll all work together. Some manufacturers out there, um, instead of, or some even some distributors out there, instead of saying, okay, I have a four and seven eighths inch wall, but no wall in this industry is perfect. So what I'm gonna do is allow an extra eighth or an extra, an extra eighth on each side and my my uh, jam depth is going to be six inch for a four and seven eighths inch wall. What that allows for is that eighth of an inch gap or sixteenth of an inch on each side to be able to move that jam around. And if the wall isn't perfect, you allow yourself a little bit of wiggle room to install that uh, jam into your uh, either steel stud or wood stud without any, having any problems. You're going to go through and cock that sheetrock sheet rock anyway. So a 16th of an inch gap is going to be perfectly fine. What you don't want is whenever you have a, you know, a four and seven eighths inch um, throat, five and three quarter inch uh, jam depth, you go to slide that uh, frame into your sheetrock and your, um, or you go to slide that, that frame in, you set it in, then you put sheetrock in behind it, and then you're banging that sheetrock in in order to make it work. Um, you end up scratching that sheetrock back, peeling that uh, paper back, and it's just going to uh, crack sheetrock, break sheetrock, and it's just going to be a problem. I'm not saying that happens every time. I'm just saying that that could be a potential problem. Silly me, by the way. I'm telling you guys all about the, the uh, frame and how it, it works with a door, and I'm telling you all about the soffit and how it works telling you about the stuff, but I haven't talked to you about the face. Uh, I do apologize um, for that. Being a, a door and frame guy, I just don't even think about the face sometimes. If we look at this face right here, going on the, um, the hollow metal frame, this can be provided in numerous different sizes. Some of the most common sizes that you'll see, or the most common size that you'll see, is two inches. Um, but you can also see an inch and a half or one inch, depending on what you uh, what the aesthetics are in the building. But you could also see four inches, not only at the head, but also on the sides as well. You usually don't see it on the sides um, just for the simple fact that in, here in a second, I'll show you what the head uh, means. And why it, it, it comes out in four inch four inches whenever you're dealing with masonry block. So. Let's take a look at um, some more frame profiles. This is a single rabbit right here on the left. This is a double rabbit, which we talked about both of these before. This one right here would be considered uh, nearly equal. And then this is a cased opening. Now, why would we use a cased opening a hollow metal frame? Why wouldn't we just put sheetrock up and and call it a day? Well, what a lot of people do is they want to keep the aesthetics of a building the same throughout. So say we have a break room that has no door, but we don't want to just have a finished uh, wall um, that's sheetrock or anything like that that could potentially, potentially be damaged. We'll then schedule or specify a cased opening um, hollow metal jam. And what that would be used for is just the aesthetics. Now, what you could also see is if we had a door, like say a pocket door or even a, um, a, a biparting door or anything like that. I shouldn't say pocket door because you would need a pocket door frame. So excuse me, a biparting door or even um, an opening with rescue hardware. That's going to take um, a special type of door panel that's going inside of it and special type of hardware you would use use the case to name and as you can see in this example here we have a it's we have either center hung or offset hung uh, could be pivots 
and what we or double acting hinge and what we would use this for is if we had rescue hardware in a hospital that rescue hardware has to be allowed and the frame and door has to be allowed to where it swings both ways now how do we swing a frame or a door into a frame um, if it had a stop on it it'd be impossible so they used a cased opening frame and a thing called a rest uh, like a rescue stop which that's a, a whole different program and if you need information on rescue hardware rescue stops i have a perfect manufacturer that can be utilized um, just hit me up and i'll let you know but you use that rescue stop um, in a way that whenever there's pressure on the door say a, a person falls in the restroom or something along those lines and they're up against the door and they you know they can't get out because they maybe they've injured their, themselves or something along those lines uh, rescue hardware allows you to be able to push that door open or pull that door um, to you to where it allows them to open the door allows the patient to um, to go down safely and allows you to access them to where you can rescue them So digging deep in, into more jam profiles, this is going to be a double egress frame. As you can see in this frame description here, on one side of the jam, you have two and five eighths of an inch on the face. On the opposite side of the jam, you have an inch and three eighths on the face. What this is used for, if you look here, you see that two and five eighths of an inch on this head. When you marry these things up, it needs to look like it's built into one piece. So by having a two and five eighths inch face on the head of this side, marrying up to a two and five eighths inch face on this side, which it has to be two and five eighths inch face because of the way that the throat and the stop and the uh, soffit um, is built, it will allow you to have an aesthetically pleasing frame on both sides to where it looks similar on both sides um, and whenever it marries up um, it'll all look like one hollow metal jam but the the hinge jam and the hinge jam will be um, opposite of each other so that way they you know whenever the door opens it'll open um, left hand reverse on one side left hand reverse on the opposite side same with the head the stop on this side will be on the um, are on the inside and the stop on this side will be on the opposite side mainly used in hospitals so a drywall frame there's going to be two types of drywall frames that we're going to talk about the first one this is a drywall frame drywall frames are shipped to the job site or we're going to talk about two different types of knockdown frames excuse me Ship to the job site, knocked down, and are installed. So this is a post wall install frame. So you can't take a welded jam that's supposed to wrap the wall. You can't take that and just slide it into a jam or into a wall because it will never work. So what you use is a knockdown frame. You go in and install one um, one leg first. Usually your hinge jam install your hinge jam make sure that it's square everything lines up then you install your head jam into your hinge jam and then lastly at an angle you install your strike jam into the head jam and then swing the bottom leg over make sure that it's uh, square straight true uh, no twists or anything like that and then to secure it you have two methods. The first method at the top of the um, frame here is going to be a compression anchor. What it does is as you screw it in, you screw it in right here. There's a thing called a compression anchor, and it's visible here with a number three Phillips head screw. Um, as you tighten it, it'll put pressure on this leg. Same with this side here. And as it pushes out and puts pressure, this angle here will put pressure on the head and it holds it in tight. Now, why don't you put an anchor, <coughs> excuse me, why don't you put an anchor at the head? Well, gravity 
and this angle right here that's supporting it lets you know that it's not necessary for an adequate installation of this opening. Once you have this tight, this tight, and this tight because of the compression anchors, then at the very bottom of the frame, on the face of the, of the uh, frame, um, this is installed at the soffit. This is on the face of the frame. You screw this in through either the wood stud or the metal stud that you're positioning this into. Now, you can have an optional strap anchor, but it's just an option. The standard is this base anchor here. Now, this is the other type of knockdown jam um, that you're going to see. I want to preface it, you know, with with this. However, this does say masonry, but you can and you can have a knockdown jam that looks just like this, but it's a ready to weld knockdown jam. So if you have a um, a situation where maybe you need to post apply your hollow metal frame, you could put it in just like this and weld it in the field or in your facility. In this example here, this is called a masonry construction frame. Masonry construction frame can be knocked down or welded, but most commonly welded in a masonry application. What this is used for, um, when you put this frame in to an opening, you have, um, you know, you have the ability to either provide this knockdown or welded. These right here, these little angle straps. Once you put the frame into these tabs, these are alignment tabs. You can then weld it, or you can use the. Um, you can put a hole right here, pour in masonry uh, or concrete, or you can even do existing wall anchors, which you're going to, uh, which are very common. Existing wall anchors are going to be installed either three or four on each side, depending on the size of your um, your opening, or it can even be put in with T anchors. So. If you are if you already have your wall built, what you would do is slide this frame in because there's nothing that the that's going to be behind the frame. You slide it in, so the course of your frame or the course of your wall is going to be right here. So the line of your wall or the course is going to go up here, true forever, on that two inch side, two inch side. So that's a four inch course. So you'll have a line right here for your course a line right here with your course. If you're installing it after the wall's been built, you slide it in and then you apply these um, these anchors through the soffit to hold it in. It's called an EWA anchor. <clears throat> it could also be called a pipe sleeve anchor. Now on the head of the frame, which you'll see in the next slide, this is not gonna be two inches. Most commonly in our industry, this is going to be four inches. And why is that? Because if you, I mean, if you have a cinder block wall, um, you know, with eight inch block, as that eight inch block goes up, um, this right here will be at the very top of that course if you have a four inch head. So aesthetically, the aesthetics of a wall as you build that wall up with cinder block, if you have a four inch head, it'll keep true to the course and you'll see that in the next slide. If you're building that block wall, if you're building that block wall um, and you already have your frames on site, you set your frames and then you build the, the wall up. And as you build that wall up, you use T, T anchors right here to set in place as you're building up your wall. Just like we talked about before, Two inch frame heads are provided as standard. Four inch frame heads provided to course out with eight inch masonry block wall. So as you can see, your block wall, um, you can see that right there, that right there, keeping true to that course. So that way it um, all looks perfect and pretty as we're building our building. Here's some of the, as you know, actually we talked about frames. Now we're gonna talk about doors. So I'm gonna stop right here and ask if any of you guys have any questions. Okay, doors. So let's talk about doors. 
here's some of the most common door components. I'm not going to call this a component, but at the very top and at the very bottom of the door, you're going to have a thing called an end cap, right? And that cap is going to either be inverted or flush. If you have an inverted cap, that means that you're going to have a channel inside of here and inside of here. And if it's flush, that means there's no channel at the top or at the bottom. <clears throat> this right here is going to be your hinge edge. You'll have straps here, a heavier duty strap at the top, a lighter duty strap in the middle and at the bottom. This on this side is called your lock edge. And then in the center on both sides, you're going to have a thing called the seam. Just because you don't see it in some applications doesn't mean there's not one there. You could have a seam that is filled with some sort of epoxy or bondo and then sanded smooth um, and then painted or primed, excuse me. <laughs> or you can have a seam that is fully welded, grinded smooth, and then primed. Some manufacturers, whenever you're talking about a seamless edge, will opt as a standard to um, weld, do a continuous weld from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top, and then grind smooth as opposed to doing a field um, seam because of the problems that you face um, down the line with cracking and that you know filler chipping out and it just causes problems in the field. If you want more information on that manufacturer, please let me know. Some of the other components that you'll see are a light and a louver. Um, this louver here, it doesn't always have to go at the bottom of the door. It can go in the middle, it can go at the top. It could be a full louver, it could be a full light, um, but these are just some of the components that you'll see. Going back to the top and the bottom of the door, um, with the edge construction, you'll see holes on both sides at the bottom, at the top. And what those are, are weep holes to allow for um, your door to have adequate vent ventilation. And also, in, in the event that water um, gets into, or I, I would say, um, yeah, any type of water, uh, humidity is also considered water, but it allows it to, to have an escape route at the bottom of the opening. If it does not have um, the ability to escape what you find, and you'll see this in a lot of older doors and a lot of older applications, is once that water sits, starts to fill up the opening, you'll start to see that the bottom of the door will rust out and you have to replace that. <laughs> you also see that as in frames as well. So now let's talk about types of doors. <clears throat> you have standard flush, and what that means is that there's no um, there's no preparation for a light or a louver on the face of the door. You have a still stiffened um, door, and what that is is you'll have um, joints every eight inches um, inside of the door that or their channels that I don't know how to do this with my hands, but it would be like this. It would look like this. It would look like something like like that. Um, you'd have two C channels on both sides of the door and it stiffens it with steel in the center. You'll have embossed panel. And what that is, is you have a panel uh, that is embossed on the face to allow some sort of um, aesthetic decoration. Acoustical doors. Um, this is going to be uh, sound, sound doors. Bullet resistant, where you have heavier gauge um, material that resists bullets. You have level one up to um, level six, various other levels. Hurricane resistant, tornado resistant. 
uh, lead lined. So hurricane and tornado, those are going to be um, a tested type of door, just like a bullet or acoustical door. Those are going to be tested door that um, either can resist bullets, um, resist blast, can resist wind, um, can resist pressure, um, or can resist a tornado. And just, you know, with a tornado, you're going to have wind, but you're also going to have a lot of debris and things like that. Same with hurricanes that are going to go uh, impact the door and um, cause damage or even go through the door. Lead line doors. Now, a lead line door, in this terminology, you could have lead on one side of the door, uh, lead shielding on one side of the door. You could have lead shielding on both sides of the door, um, or you could have lead shielding in the center of the uh, door itself. And what that does is limits x-rays from going through the door from the, I guess, from one side to the other. <coughs> Some door styles, as you can see here, um, you see you have a flush door, you have a, um, a vision light, you have a narrow vision, half glass, full glass, louver, and this is a, um, this is a full louver here. This is a Dutch door, and this is a full light. Now, this terminology here, the reason I went off of um, saying flush and then flush vision, narrow vision, half glass, the reason I went off of telling you what each of these means Every single manufacturer out there in the industry, whether it be from Asa Abloy or Dormacaba or Allegion, um, Dean Still, um, there's numerous other um, hollow metal manufacturers out there. They're all going to have their own um, detail on their door styles and how they're set up. Check with your, your manufacturer to see how they detail their, their doors out. But for the most part, um, an architect can use this um, as their terminology, um, and, you know, in order to uh, present their doors on their plans, but th those, this terminology is going to change between different manufacturers. <clears throat> so this is what um, it's going to look like whenever you look at a seamed edge and a seamless edge. As you can see um, in this photo here, this is a seamless edge. And as you can see, this right here is stitched um, all the way down the door. It can also be continuously welded. And what happens then is this is um, grinded smooth to be flush with each side of, um, of the door. <clears throat> and then it's primed. Whenever you have a seamed edge, this seam right here is going to be visible at all times. This seamless edge can also be filled with some sort of epoxy or some type of filler, then sanded smooth and then primed. It just depends on the manufacturer that you're using. Um, you know, will change with how they do their standards and how they perform uh, their seamless edge. Let's talk about some door cores. Some of the most common that you're going to see are going to be polystyrene and honeycomb, but you could also see polyurethane, vertically stiffened, mineral fiberboard, and sound resistant. Now, each core that you use inside of the door is going to change um, its capability. If you have mineral fiberboard, um, that <laughs> door can be rated up to three hours. If you have a vertically stiffened door, that doesn't mean that it's only going to have steel stiffening inside of it. You could also have mineral fiberboard or polystyrene in between those spaces of the ribs or the, the studs. Um, and then, you know, it will have different capabilities. So you can have a vertically stiffened door that's mineral fiberboard that's rated up to three hours. You could have a, um, you know, a sound resistant door here you have a polystyrene door you can have a polyurethane door that um, you need to meet some sort of lead uh, credential with or a lead standard with excuse me <clears throat> but then i guess after talking about the cores uh, they don't have much more to say about doors they just talk about the um, the openings division eight is where you're going to find the specification for hollow frames and doors 
Um, Division 081100 is going to be encompassing of all doors and frames, whether they be fire rated frames, sound resistant frames, um, or, or even standard hollow metal frames, um, masonry frames, things like that. Excuse me. But as you go through the section, um, 0812, excuse me, is going to be your frames only. 0813 is going to be your doors. <clears throat> and then post specification to be able to reference um, the, the standards that you're going to find in the specification. You can look at um, SDI, NAM, HMMA, DHI, things like that. Here are some of the references um, for hollow metal doors and frames. This is SDI um, 100, this is the, recommend, the recommended specifications for standard steel doors and frames. Um, this is going to be, you know, how the gauges work with the top of the frame um, on the, the straps that are used, the gauges that are used. Um, and you're going to see a gauge reference here on the next slide. And then the test procedures that are used, um, you know, for priming and painting doors so that way they don't um, rust and then so on and so forth. What to specify on frames? Well, the biggest thing is the gauge of the materials. You know, what type of use is going to be in that uh, facility at both the exterior and the interior will determine what type of gauge that you're going to be using at that at that frame or door. Um, do you have masonry or drywall configuration? Is the frame knocked down or welded? What are the anchoring requirements? We, you know, in this um, in this presentation here, it doesn't talk about anchors other than for masonry straps or um, existing wall anchors, but there's various types of anchoring that's used throughout the industry um, to attach frames to to walls because you don't just have one type of wall. You have which you have wood stud, you have metal stud, and how do you um, specify between the two of those? Uh, make, make sure to consult a professional prior to doing so. But if you have wood stud, you're going to probably want to use a wood stud anchor that wraps around that wood stud and ties into the back of it. If you have steel stud, you're going to want to use a steel stud anchor that is basically a Z clip. It looks like this and what it does is it butts up um, flat or flush against that steel stud and then it ties into the back. Or you could even use a multi-purpose anchor um, some people call it an all-in-one anchor, multi-purpose anchor, <clears throat> things like that. You know, what it does, it allows you to have the ability to use existing wall anchor, the steel stud anchor, the um, which would be your Z anchor or your C clip. Um, and then it also has the straps to where you can fold that around for a wood stud. Um, but make sure you know what type of anchor that you're going to be using or you're going to be spending a lot of money trying to figure it out uh, while it's in the field. Is it galvanized or, if it, or is it cold, cold rolled? You know, the, the way that the pandemic has treated us, it has changed the way that we specify um, our hollow metal frames and doors. You know, is, the, is there availability of cold rolled steel in America the same way that there was two years ago? Or do we have to use galvanized material? What is the use of galvanized versus cold rolled steel? Well, um, cold rolled steel is going to be a ferrous material, material and galvanized is going to be a hot dipped zinc material that um, is more resistant to um, rusting. And then <clears throat> is there any special applications? Do I have to have special reinforcements either at the head or at the hinge jam or the strike jam? Um, are there lead requirements? Do I have to have post recycle or pre recycle requirements on um, what type of lead credits are we trying to achieve on our job? We have to figure all that out. And then what's the paint requirements um, on the job? You know, do we just use a standard primer? Do we use a rust inhibited primer? Um, most of the time you're going to have it in their specifications on what type of primer that is required um, for any type of building. But if it's at the exterior or even at the interior, you want to be able to limit the availability or the ability of the frame to rust because you want it to be set there for life, hopefully, which it never happens, but that's the hope. 
here's some SDI and ANSI standards for um, level one through four um, standard duty and maximum duty hollow metal doors and frames. As you can see here, here's the different models that are that are used, whether it be flush or full flush or seamless, seamless, excuse me, uh, frames. Um, here's your gauging for standard duty, heavy duty, extra heavy duty, and then maximum duty. What do we look to specify in doors? Well, a lot of it is going to be the same thing, but you don't have any type of anchoring in doors except for at your hinges, whether it be a tenuous hinge or a butt hinge. But what is the door thickness? You know, some manufacturers require a different type of thickness um, to prevent sound, you know, the sound attenuation between one side of the panel to the other side. So you will have to use a thicker door to be able to fit in all the sound panel and stuff like that that goes into the door. Standard manufacturers, um, you know, standard manufacturing practice, there's an inch and three eighths door, an inch and three quarter door, two and a quarter door, but you also have a three and an eighth inch door um, for special circumstances. So be able to, you know, make sure that um, you pay attention to your plans and specifications and also the manufacturer and how they manufacture their doors prior to um, prior to just scheduling out your frames because if you don't have your rabbit correct the door is not going to fit inside of there what type of core are we using for our door what type of rating is on that door where is it going into is it a sound space is a is it a fire rated opening um, does it need to be still stiffened where do we use still stiffened doors um, some of these things are are paramount you know, prior to determining what we're going to be using for an opening um, do we have a door that's out there that um, we can use at the exterior that doesn't have to be still stiffened um, you know whether it be seamless and welded and um, you know have the same tensile strength as a um, still stiffened door they are out there what type of material gauge are we going to use for our, our um, door uh, to prevent bullets to prevent blast um, whether it's at the exterior or the interior you know, all of these things um, as far as door core and then door gauge is going to have a huge determination on your door weight, which is then going to tie into the hinge strap that's going to be used at the top of the door um, to be able to support that weight that's being used. If it's lead lined, it's, there's a lot to go. That, there's a lot that goes into it. Is it galvanized or cold rolled? Is it exterior or interior? You know, we talked about that before. The door edge configuration, is it seamless? Does it have a seam? Is it filled? Um, is it seamed and filled? Um, how is it how's it tied together? Are there any types of special reinforcements that are going to be needed for, for our frame, whether it be at our lock or our exit device, our closer reinforcement? Um, if we have an exit device, do we do we have to have an exit device at the at the back side of that exit device to reinforce that that door? Um, does it have to be through bolted through? Um, things like that. The top and the bottom cap, we talked about this earlier, but is it an inverted channel or is it a flush channel? Um, what are we using there? Um, if it's exterior or interior, there's big differences between the two. And then paint requirements, just like we had previously. I'm sorry, I'm five minutes over, but we have really quickly, um, I know this is another AI presentation on fire doors, but this is the New York Nature Center. This gives you some thoughts on, this is gonna show you what happens um, and, and why we use hollow metal doors. So properly closed fire door prevented fire damage to this entire section of the building. This is the unaffected side. You can see right here, the affected side. Unaffected side on the outside, the affected side on the inside of this opening. This is a um, fire separation wall here, a fire rated door. And what does it prevent? If you look inside of that, look inside of this room. Um, this is a three hour fire rated wall, three hour fire rated door, and it prevented building, you know, complete building loss of this facility here. And as you can see, just in this quick photo, the importance of specifying your hollow metal doors and frames correctly. Now, if these guys had um, 
you know, maybe proper gasketing and things like that, they could have prevented the smoke damage that was on the other side. But good Lord, look at the smoke that went in through this building that didn't go into this building. You see that smoke damage here and fire damage there? That is all that happened. It's amazing. 